We're ready to start the, uh, the evening, although I always get worried when it says no input is detected as an opening <laughs> statement. I'm hoping this will work in a minute when, when we get going. It's an absolute um, uh, delight and a real pleasure to welcome back to the, uh, to the A this evening David Adjay, who joins us. Um, um, and I think a really a great moment also in that it coincides with his current exhibition at the Whitechapel Gallery, Whitechapel Art Gallery in East London. Um, and a first major retrospective of his work, which is currently up there, which opened at the end of January and will be up uh, through March, um, which I, I wholly recommend to all of you to go see. Um, the Whitechapel Art Gallery is a perfect kind of venue in a number of ways for this show of David's. I think not just because it happens to be the neighborhood where some of his early and incredibly original work first appeared um, over the last several years, um, but also because it's a gallery that happens to be dedicated to the combination or the, the relationship between art and architecture as a kind of topic, which happens to be one of the driving forces of David's work and has been since his earliest projects. <coughs> um, the, the title of that exhibition, which is um, Making Public Buildings, um, really summarizes the focus of this exhibition of David's work, which is in a way recording a shift that's occurring with his, uh, within his own body of work as he moves away from the domestic scale, um, the domestic space projects that, uh, that his reputation has been founded on the last several years to increasingly larger and more complex forms of cultural and civic projects. Um, um, that work that, that starts with the houses in the late 90s and early 2000s here in London, which um, can be characterized as focusing on, um, let's say, the emotive and sensual aspects of the experience of our built environment, including built space and architecture, is something that he's very much carrying forward in, in relation to these larger um, and more complex commissions that the office is currently working on. Um, and time and again in those projects, what he's focused on is the way in which our experience of a space and the materials of a building are actually materials that can be shaped and understood and directed at forms of architectural experimentation, um, which his work has been working has been going through over and over again in incredibly original um, and at times almost alienating ways, but which in every case creates projects that after an initial kind of shock of sometimes the alien and strange properties that they contain reveal an incredibly intelligent and, and unexpected form of discovery in terms of how they carve space out of sometimes incredibly unassuming and, and almost barely noticeable sites. Um, <coughs> in 2000, David um, reformed his office as AdJ Associates, um, which, is the, which is located in East London near Shoreditch, um, and in recent years has moved towards a series of cultural and civic projects that have included the Stephen Lawrence Center in Deptford, um, the Idea Stores in East London, the most recent one of which opened on Whitechapel Street, um, not far down the, down the road from the, the gallery where the work is currently on exhibition. Um, and of course, the new, uh, new Kunsthall Gallery in Denver, Colorado, which is just going on site right now. Um, David studied architecture and received a Master of Architecture degree at the RCA in London in the early 1990s and formed his office right after that. Um, has been a tutor here at the AA and worked with Makoto Seto and, and Nicholas Hirsch uh, here in the Diploma School uh, and is currently a visiting professor at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia in the U.S. And we're very pleased to be able to welcome him back to the AA this evening. Um, it's so nice to see so many people here. <laughs> Um, thank you, Brett, for your introduction. Um, I wanted to show, um, I'm just going to start and go straight into it. I wanted to show five, uh, five different sort of scales and to really use, that, use the projects as a way of trying to discuss um, the sort of slightly provocative title, um, Making Public Buildings. Um, I, I sort of made that title, sort of coined that title as a way of trying to kind of obviously talk about the shifts that Brett just kind of um, alluded to um, in the office, whereby um, sort of since 2000 we won a sort of uh, a sort of quite I guess for a small practice a large handful of public projects, public projects that were absolutely better than the public realm, but also kind of really started to manifest the sort of second half of my interest, um, which was a notion of trying to discuss how um, the city is shaped and to how and to discuss the notion of a 
private retreat and a public porosity. Um, that has always been it, in in the sort of in the back of the work, the sort of in the back of my mind, the, the sort of driver um, towards um, the sort of way in which I made the work, and really sort of positioned the way in which I set up um, the early houses very much as sort of hermetic retreated uh, systems of a certain kind of interiority. Um, and then hopefully with the public projects, a certain kind of um, sort of exhalation, a certain kind of sort of connectivity to the city in, a, in hopefully new and sort of relational ways. Um, so in a way, it's very nice um, that a few years ago I made I talked here and it was about the houses really and then about talking about these new things and it's very nice to kind of talk about this here. Um, the first project I'm going to talk about is sort of somewhere between the house and the public uh, building and it's a, a studio building that I've just completed, my first building in America um, and it's in Brooklyn and in, 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 um, in New York. It's in Vanderbilt, it's on a street called Vanderbilt Street. It's just a sort of aerial Google map. Of of the sort of grid, uh, the sort of typical terraces in the grid um, that you find in Brooklyn, um, and it's the red long strip. This is, uh, this is, is this the pointer? <laughs> Where's the button? <laughs> That's mine. Put it down. Oh, really? It's yours. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> Gosh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> that was terrible. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Brooklyn. <laughs> um, Brooklyn's really kind of amazing. It has this incredible sort of grid of brownstones and this kind of industrial sort of and large sort of scale civic buildings, but has this incredible kind of corner life um, where these incredible stores and these incredible sort of small pockets of community sort of occur across that grid. And um, my clients are uh, two artists, two artists who deal with, I guess, light and printed media. Um, Lorna Simpson, who um, started with films, did prints from films, kind of dealing with notions of um, identity politics, um, feminist politics, um, but also the idea of the image, working with the notion of the image has sort of moved into making um, art films, full-scale art films, which are quite extraordinary, dealing with architecture, dealing with the body and architecture. And Jim Casabir, who makes um, reconstructions of fictional ideas of uh, architecture or architectural space. These are not real. These are huge constructions that he makes in his studio that he elaborately lights and photographs and, and works with. So th it was very interesting because, in a way, for me, also central to this interiority that I'm sort of interested in, in um, the notion of the private realm. <laughs> Have I done something to it? Okay. Sorry about this. No, no, no. Down, uh, back to front. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, sh I wasn't warned. <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> there's a kind of notion of a sort of, I, I'm very interested in a certain kind of biography that occurs within the domestic project. So there's a kind of autobiographical sort of script within it. Um, so in a way, when I wanted to make the studio for this uh, when they asked me to make the studio, the project took on um, the notion of really dealing with um, a series of perception systems within construction, whereby this long terrace, this long strip, is made as a very sort of quite clunky, quite um, um, sort of matter-of-fact steel frame building. It wasn't about somehow trying to make a series of... Um, sort of perfect, sort of reduced sort of structural systems. It was about just solving span, span issues. And then talking about a series of lining systems which then could negotiate a series of distortions within the plan which would create curious um, um, 
um, perspectives and curious junctions, which would be something that would only happen traditionally, I guess, in a kind of modified building, but would be something that would be instigated as a beginning. So you have these nuances in the plan, something which looks incredibly simple, but actually is quite complicated um, at the end to construct. The plans, um, just quickly going through it for you, is, it's, that's the street, there's an entry here, there's a cavity here, the floors are here, and this is the first studio, and then there's a, a yard. Um, with a deck. You go up a stair and there's a kind of introverted reading space with a chamber that connects back to the street across the void. And then you wind up again and you get the second studio, which is a roof studio, a roof sort of loft space, a crumpled space with um, a stair that takes you up onto a mezzanine, again an introverted space which is just lit with skylights, which has no aspect to the, uh, uh, that street front but is only linked at the top of the stair to the outside. Um, this is the building um, completed, so it sort of finishes um, a lot. This is a school parking lot and makes a kind of gable to that end. So it's a four-story building here with the sort of double height studios at the back. Um, the building is um, uh, sort of covered with a woven polypropylene fiber, which is screen printed with a black lacquer, which is allowed to sort of fade across it so that you get this dark to light, which is then alternated across the, this is the facade. And what it does is that it picks up in, in, um, in Brooklyn, there's a very kind of, very Amsterdam style, high, you know, high gable end architecture that sort of suddenly starts to happen with the civic buildings and some of the terrace houses, um, brownstones. <coughs> so in a way it makes a kind of oblique um, black pitch, um, which is what we're calling the house, pitch black. Um, volume, um, which plays with this, but it plays with it three-dimensionally, because the roof pyramids away to that point. At the back, it's a cavity, and in a way, it's a cavity to the sort of Brooklyn landscape. It becomes a kind of, a sort of frame to that. Through the door, this is the cavity that you sort of come into, and you start to notice the sort of, these ruptures and these um, negotiations that are happening between structure and form. So just looking back, um, and this is the first studio in here, and noticing the window, the first window, which connects across. Can we take the lights down a bit? It's a bit is that okay? Can you? <coughs> is that all right? Is, is it Yeah. So in that cavity looking up, um, these are the two volumes which are connecting to the outside window and this is daylight coming through these crevices. And there's an artificial light space here. And that slide. Then through into the studio, um, this is the main first studio which is a kind of almost a white cube studio, double height, almost kind of referencing and sort of referring to Oz Enfant studio. Um, the Oz Enfant studio that Le Corbusier built in a way, in a very sort of direct way, you'll see if you turn it around, this, this architecture of a kind of studio light, but it's on the ground floor. And then the courtyard, which is beyond this, which then frames this very sort of hopper-esque sort of back. And then looking back, the second view, um, sort of a massive gable, sort of party wall frame, and this is the double height studio, and this is the crumple studio, so it's a double studio on top of each other with the sort of mid spaces between. Then back to walking up, you c it's hard to see, but there are these distortions that are occurring. The materials are extremely simple, um, either screeded concrete dyed or um, oak stained. And this is going up to the second studio. That's the top and that's the second window which looks back to the front. So I'm being didactic in the way I'm explaining it, but I think it's probably the only way to do it. Then when you come up, this is the th second studio, which is not is a crumpled cube in a way. So, so the distortion of the roof and the pyramid becomes apparent. And the windows are orientated, obviously, picking up certain sort of um, light uh, moments in from morning to evening, morning to uh, sort of sunset. And that's looking back down at that studio from the mezzanine. And then this sort of introverted room, the last room, 
which is in sort of in this sort of top. And then looking down and seeing that's the, the Brooklyn sort of backyard. And this becomes a flooding, this is a sort of trough of water, which is a sort of fountain. And it's a kind of little quote to Jim Casimir, who's basically doing work, which is about flooding architecture to talk about this duality. So this floods this entire area. It sort of overflows as a kind of trap. I was very interested in the sort of the sort of textile quality in which this polypropylene would sort of behave, and to kind of see this house in a kind of as a kind of almost like a sort of cloth, um, sort of around this body. And then that's it from the front. That's the front door. These are the two apertures that connect. And you'll see in, in the evening the classic architecture shot, and. This is from that window that is in the entrance back, and just looking at that, that Brooklyn scene. So, in a way, this house is kind of strange for me because it's sort of it's a sort of house where it sort of negotiates between these two realms, and it starts to blur between the porosity and the sort of hermetic. And it's the first time that I've actually started to work um, that way, where I'm sort of shifting between these two things. And it, for me, it sort of came out of that conversation um, about what a studio is. At, at, at once, a kind of place which is you know, about inspiration and, and interiorized in terms of its thinking, but also about a place to kind of, especially with these two artists, the, the context being incredibly important to them as a kind of reference point. They decided to move there. They live around the corner, site their, and then to site their whole operation there rather than being in Manhattan, which is a more, more fashionable thing to do. Um, then, in a way, it's a good segue to talk about Denver. This is, so these are the two American projects that just finished. This has just started. And Denver is a sort of a project to establish a museum of contemporary art in uh, a, 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 a city called uh, well, Denver in Colorado State. Um, Colorado is very interesting. It's really cowboy territory, I guess. To be cliched, sorry. Um, it has the Rocky Mountains surrounding it. It's incredibly beautiful. It's a mile up in the air. And um, the most striking thing about it, I think, is, is the light, I think. <laughs> it's uh, quite extraordinary. Um, sort of geographical position. And that was intriguing to me. Um, the, notion, the idea here is that um, they, they're they incredible collectors. What's ironic about Colorado is that it also has the largest concentration of collectors of uh, contemporary art in America, which is the irony of the whole thing. So you would never know <laughs> this cow town was exactly <laughs> where the whole contemporary art scene was being sort of, n sort of sto stored, stashed rather, stored and stashed. So there are incredible collections here. and. Uh, so Daniel Liebeskind won a competition three years ago um, to build a, a huge museum of modern art, which is going to house most of his collections. And then I won this competition a year and a half ago um, to build the contemporary, which is a non-collecting space, so that you have the two complements to sort of complete the sort of art, cult the art, sort of uh, the art cultural side for the city. Um, so in trying to kind of dis sort of discover how to make a Kunsthalle um, um, for this particular place. Um, I mean, this is the, you get these views just looking from any, any of these apartments. It's amazing. It's ringed by the Rocky Mountains. So it's, as a city, it doesn't look like anything, but when you look out, it's extraordinary. Um, you have this incredible sky and mountains all the time. Sites in a kind of typical developer landscape, townhouses, you know, a slab building here. Um, they're calling these art houses now, <laughs> being sold. It's, it's a sort of <laughs> <laughs> nothing you can do. You're sort of brought into it. Um, and what? But what was interesting to me is that we have a corner condition. And I don't know if you know American cities, but for me, American cities are have a, a very disconnected sense of public life in a way. It's a very much a sort of an uh, observational public life and quite a hermetic public life, um, which um, it was something I was trying to kind of use the building in a way to kind of de develop a kind of relational context to the people that might gather around <laughs> it and in a way a certain kind of reaching out to the sort of building. So the project really is about um, conceptually making three containers um, which arrange themselves on a site to make a certain kind of miniaturization, almost like the Lilliputian sort of miniaturization of the city into, uh, sort of, into a sort of an urban public 
um, people place. These three volumes are then connected by a system which interlocks them. Um, these are just some of the early things. And then that volume is literally sheathed in a thermal sort of environmental enclosure which buffers against the harsh extremity of the, uh, of the Denver um, weather because it, you know, it goes to minus 15 and goes up to sort of 35 degrees or 40 degrees. An incredible light, incredible sunshine, and uh, it's a super bright. Um, so really extreme environmental conditions. So in a way, you get, it's, a bu it's, it's, it's three buildings within a building. And um, the buildings really sort of organize themselves very, very directly. The, the corner site is somehow, in the absence of being able to kind of negotiate a sort of space for a public realm, the corner site is acknowledged as a kind of uh, marker, driver, for, um, for making the public announcement for the building. And one thing that was very important very early on was to try and something I've been kind of very interested in in all the public projects is this notion of dissolving the, the, the front door to make a stitching, a very direct sort of relational stitch between the urban um, pavement and the building so that they, wi they sort of absolutely interweave and sort of in a way stitch and directly kind of bind as parts of the same forum, whereby for me the notion of um, the building taking on this notion of publicness becomes very implicit and clear. It, it then performs beyond its sort of symbolism, its image, as a kind of public realm building. So in a way, it becomes a kind of space in which public sort of interaction suddenly occurs, hopefully. <laughs> it's not, in a way, trying to somehow solve anything. It's just, in a way, trying to kind of, kind of excite a certain kind of continuation of that and not just let it stop when you enter buildings. Um, so sequentially, this corner wraps in and folds until you get to the top, it spirals to the top, and then you have these three volumes which then articulate themselves on the roof and become a sort of roof terrain for the city. I won't go through the plans very directly, but it's you, just to say that these are the three volumes here. One includes the key service driver for the building, um, and then as you go up, um, these become the key. There are five major showing spaces. There are three on this floor with a sort of informal showing space, which is this link, the bar that binds the three volumes. This is the public sort of void space, which is in the center. Um, and then you come up and it articulates itself into a member's pavilion and then an education pavilion and then an outdoor sort of an art garden um, and a sort of public terrace. Building is clad in uh, gray glass, um, mirror tinted and sandblasted um, with uh, a concrete, black concrete base tinted glass and silver stained timber top. We did lots of model studies. This is this notion of the entrance. So the entrance is really a ramp, a gentle ramp that takes you up. It's a roller shutter and then there's an automatic door as you get in. So it's really a sort of invitational situation. And at that corner you're really dealing with two major windows. This one which looks, gives you back the axis to the city and this one which is the view straight from the entrance into all the galleries on the ground floor. On the street, the main volume, that's the main window. The, so the, the structure becomes a kind of ghost, a sort of ninja ghost, I guess, behind the skin, which becomes transparent depending on how the light is. The light goes around the back of the building, so actually you're always getting a shadow on the front, which is something I was playing with. So you start to get incredible transparency and luminosity on the back. This is that center between the three volumes, and then these are very fine apertures, really really tuned so that we only get a certain amount of daylight, but there's a certain daylight that just marks the walls but doesn't sort of draws these lines around the space. And they're very neutral walls which are to be kept neutral but can have artworks on them. And um, this is kind of being on one of the galleries, the bar, sort of linking the three spaces. This is that bar sort of going around and sort of th this sort of apparent, it's not a cantilever, it's actually held within the structure, but this notion that you get a sort of almost as it were, a sort of Miesian overhead canopy, which gives you a sort of a notion of a kind of mythical view here. And then the main exhibition space is being almost like the sort of architecture that you pass through. This is lined in another polycarbonate that we're working with, which is a natural polycarbonate. So it's another woven fiber board, which also acts as an insulator and spans. Um, these are about 30 foot spaces. 
and then the whole space is lit naturally with daylight. We have a track. Um, we've sort of been doing incredible modeling tests to make sure that we could get the luminosity, and because of the incredible luminosity in Denver, we can achieve it, but we have tracks for nighttime um, viewing. So it becomes completely daylit spaces, which means that the energy consumption that we're using on the building is greatly reduced. We think it's going to be, I don't know if you know American things, it's going to be the first gold certified um, LEED certificate uh, museum in America, which is basically sort of, basically means it's sort of winning green points. It's sort of the buffer skin and this notion of energy use is something that nobody's tried yet in a museum. Then the pavilion on the roof and the way it relates to the context. And then the building. This is without its context, but it's got a surround of other buildings. And what's really nice is that we've been asked to build a special uh, building for a collector just behind it. So this glass, which looks like a crazy idea, is a, is a sort of foot and a half cavity, which is actually breathing. Of course, it's act just acting as a thermal wall um, and allowing us to do lots of things um, to keep the building sort of stable. So then you have that, and you have the, the sort of volumes, which are then sort of mass. Um, coming to London, um, I'll just talk about the two projects in London. Um, the idea store, of course, the two, uh, the two idea stores. I'm only building two. There is a, the program was to, to develop seven. Um, the first one was built by an architect called Bissett Adams. Um, it was an interior, and then I won the competition to build the two buildings. And um, it looks, well, we're not sure, but it looks like the client is going to now develop the rest of the program as interior, so we declined from taking part um, further in it. But essentially, we built these two, proto what for us were prototypes about a new way of kind of laminating an, um, um, a public infrastructure into um, sort of uh, scenarios of sort of domestic public life. And f for me, very <laughs> clearly, and um, the notion of making a public building was a big sort of head scratch, you know, uh, what, what, what to do with this kind of neighborhood and what to do in this kind of area. And, you know, this is Chris Street. This is where that first building is. And this is the most, I guess, sort of post-19th century sort of sense of a public space where the sort of the discourse occurs between the various neighbors from the Bang Bangladeshi to working class um, English right through to the Ethiopian and some of the uh, city people that crisscross through to other things. Because just around the right next to this is this, um, which is urbanistically quite tough. Um, Chris Street really <coughs> attempts to not to make um, uh, an object too much. <laughs> It tries to make a sort of lamination. I was very interested in a kind of almost like an archaeological lamination uh, and a sort of horizontal layer which counters this very powerful vertical that's in the Lansbury estate. Um, it tries to negotiate this idea of developing a, uh, a diagonal and um, a random system, a weave, an urban weave. The weave is very important to me, as you've probably seen in uh, sort of work, really. Um, and this notion of um, slip and stitch and this notion of making um, specificity out of different, uh, as it were, what would look like mistakes, but are actually kind of pattern repetition and slippages. Um, the plan is incredibly simple. So this lamination occurs over the existing um, shopping. It becomes a sort of hook over it. It doesn't attempt to kind of make any judgment, ethical judgment about this. It's just two systems. And then the space is, again, too sort of cellular and open. And then the volume really, in a kind of very direct relational way, adjusts itself to the context. Um, there are residential buildings here. This is a public front. But it doesn't, on the public front, it denies, I'm not interested in this monumentality of the facade. So it's actually the doorways on the side, sort of in the same hierarchy as the shops. So it becomes very much a simple urban stitch from the ground plane up into this volume here. And then this sort of weave around it. Plans, very simple. You have surfing, computer technology, you know, the computer surfing sites on the ground floor. This is the public room that you come into. And then you're up into the hall, 
which has its teaching rooms, classrooms, and service services. The plant and everything are buried in here because this building is overlooked by this tower. And basically, this notion of a library as a, as a disconglobulated uh, space, urban space. So, and this, uh, this, this disconglobulation allows for a kind of different interaction because there's no longer a hierarchy through the library. It's just a singular space system where the furniture takes on the role of being thing-like and sort of the thing that articulates different kind of modes of use from having a reading space to making an enclosure for a bit more privacy, for um, crash facilities, for a cafe. The walls then become the containers for the books and for study. Um, this is when I opened. I, I know people, it's, it started off with a market here, but Tower Hamlets wanted it to be clear, so they moved the market away, which is a real shame. So this is the slide I really like of this project. <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of what was what intended to, to happen. Um, this is the public room, which draws you up. Just the surfing space and the way in which people just react. The cafe um, area up above. The main hall, these curvilinear plywood. This is an extremely cheap budget. Um, um, sort of incredibly cheap budget, and it's what people don't seem to realize. That's shockingly, we had to um, we had to convince the cladding consultant. We had to find somebody in Germany who wanted to break into the English market and gave us a huge discount. It's the only way we were able to get that kind of quality actually on the building. So the open space allows these kind of informal scenarios, and then these are the child spaces coming off that, and the classrooms. Um, uh, which operate the cellular systems next to it. So really what you're getting in this building is a, is a mixed program, which makes, it, uh, for me, a new topology, which is why they rebranded it and called it an idea store. But essentially, it's mixing lifelong learning, mind and body, with, you know, uh, so I in a way, making a new kind of uh, reading of what a library might be. It's not just a, uh, a space for books. So then in Whitechapel, um, Whitechapel was seen as the sort, of, um, the sort of main building, I guess, the sort of flagship building, which would um, sort of completely identify the, the, the sort of rollout that they were, that Tower Hamlets was, is doing, and would be the sort of natural replacement for the very beautiful um, 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 Arts and Crafts building, which is next to the Whitechapel Gallery, which it replaces. And I don't know if you know anybody knows about the Whitechapel Art Gallery, but it's an extraordinary building, which was a kind of hub of that sort of East End intellectual life. But the building was a very beautiful, crafted building and spoke about a certain kind of enlightenment, I think. Um, and in a way, for me, the ambition here, apart from kind of working with the everyday and working with this kind of notion of the kind of public perception of a kind of public arena was to also kind of bring, to kind of play another game of this quality of um, the sort of the, the strength that the other library had in a way to somehow, somehow recall that in what this building was going to be about. This is the high street, which for me is a really fantastic phenomena, really. One of the few sort of urban public pho phenomena in London, which is really real. I mean, real in the sense that it's not, pic it's not pictorial, it's not set up as a kind of tourist uh, market, which most markets become. It's very much an everyday working market for, for the community, and you can buy everything here. Um, and it does very beautiful things. I mean, the markets basically make an, a natural acoustic buffer to the main high road, and you have this incredible sort of, sort of human corridor, which stretches all the way down to Whitechapel uh, Gallery and right up. Here, the sort of, the, the weaving becomes um, a sort of layered weaving, so the complexity becomes um, much more interesting, and the di diagonals are then set up much more clearly. And then the building becomes basically um, a podium with a, a mesian block, which is distorted, um, with all its services brought into the center, and then a pavilion on the back. So it's really a tripartite system, because essentially the building becomes a device for negotiating the kind of incredible openness of the site. It's not, it's not just a single facade. There's the High Street, there's Brady Street here, there's this incredible car park at the back, which is a very public shopping center, um, Safeway, or uh, sorry, Sainsbury. And then we I introduce a right-of-way that we, 
you know, we made into a, a, sort, of pri a sort of pedestrian route on the side. So it's a four-sided building negotiating four, contact, four, four different positions. So it became important that the building for me in the first experiment was to break away from the hierarchy of the library idea, the, this idea of the kind of the stacks, the reading rooms, et cetera, are kind of completely discombobulated into a single plane plate. And to kind of move away from the tyranny for me of the notion of a architecture kind of manifested through complicated double heights and triple heights that are somehow made as a kind of spectacle for sort of public civility or something like that, which I find not interesting in these kind of buildings at the moment. Um, and so I wanted to kind of invert that and to say that actually maybe the interest or the kind of publicness has to operate within the kind of urban realm. So we developed a, another environmental buffer which would augment a kind of scenario whereby instead of understanding the sort of the sort of uh, the entry into the building as a kind of doorway of any sort, you would enter the building by simply walking underneath it. And that, that engagement would already start your, um, your sort of relationship with the building. So uh, indirectly, every day, if you pass this building, you're having a relationship with it. And it was not a facade. It was a kind of spatial condition that you were being brought in, a blurred interior-exterior uh, condition. And then from that, the porosity of the building can work by having escalators, which we brought on the front, and then um, doors on the sides. So it's, it's not singular in any way. It, it operates by having this overhang. There's an, a door on its passage, a door on the main facade, and then two doors as you go up the building. And the building is developed so it has a very fat uh, core which pulls everything in. It's, there are no ducts in the building. It's a cast concrete building with plenums, large plenums, um, and pressurized floors. And so the stacks are held in the back. Children's uh, libraries on the ground floor and a DVD and media libraries on the ground floor here, and then you have the adult space on the first floor, which is this dance space and therapy space in the terrace. And then you have um, surfing and sort of the, the hub of the library here with its uh, classrooms. Classrooms always kind of orientated towards looking back to Whitechapel. And then as you go up, um, more versions of the same um, library, classrooms, offices, until you end up at a cafe, which is right at the top, which overlooks the entire site. So. That's, so this is the invitation of the building, and this is the, the public plane, and in a way the invitation of the building is this, that you're always negotiating. And, you know, this is the stalls closing, but this is, this is the idea of the building being engaged every day. And um, it's very beautiful for me to see how people use it when the building is closed, it's a kind of gathering point, and to see it when, it's amazing to see it when it rains and how people kind of use the space underneath it as a kind of, sort of quasi st sort of blurred public plane. Um, this is on the escalator looking up at people. These things are made so large because of these incredible risk management issues that you have to deal with, which is, just, you know, the risk of somebody jumping off this has to be mitigated. So there are certain things that actually you fight against always in making these public buildings which you cannot ov sometimes overcome uh, very easily. Um, this is the building um, looking from the east. Um, this is the passage. It has four facades. This is the side passage, and it connects sort of in a jokey way to this Sainsbury canopy. Um, this is the second route in. This is the west elevation. Um, that's it there. The cafe's on the top. The pavilion at the back. And this is this sort of elevation to the car park, and this is the pavilion, and the pavilion has, these are two firewall, you know, windows. That's the aromatherapy room, and that's the dance room, so the dancers see the cars, and the cars see the dancers, and the rest of the building is up above. That's just a close-up of that passage entry, and then the pavilion. And then when you go in, this glass building changes dramatically, and it becomes, it's a cast concrete building with precast ribs, um, and then um, a sort of raised floor on top. And only at the entries do you get punctures, which just uh, connect you very, sort of in a very sort of human scale way to activities just above you. And sort of as you pass the facade, the relationship to the market, the children's library. Um, this is up in those voids which connect through. 
and then the passages are made uh, sort of as inhabited passages and maybe the only place where they become quite traditional in a way where you get sense of stacks but actually it's the linings it's the service core and then the pavilion at the back and the dance space and its windows the staircase the escape staircase um, this is the fire escape stair which is a double stair and then that's kind of really just articulated into um, the grand stair for the building so really it's glazed the two firewalls are placed at either end so that there's always a kind of diagonal again connection through the building as you go around the core and um, you get glimpses to the other activities so it's kind of it's 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 a it's something I was very interested in kind of looking at this porosity in very kind of intimate scale not in a grand scale so the, the proportions are always very sort of very relational for me you know they're sort of measurable by by I think just seeing them this is one moment where it becomes very vertical, but it's very, 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 very thin. <coughs> this is the sort of second floor. The, um, this is just talking about the facade study. So the wind bracing is dealt with, and the books are built into this. I'm reading classrooms and the views to the market. There's always a kind of vignette given to you. The entire thing is a dry panel system. It's not. There's no wet trades. It's hardly what's only in the back area for, uh, for cost, but it's an entirely panelized building. So it's an uh, it's an entirely assembly made building, which is something that was also very important to me. Um, this is the cafe at the top, and the view to the city. Um, it's amazing because this is a space now where the taxi drivers come and stop and kind of have their tea breaks, which is really nice. And um, what I did was to change the environmental, the climatic condition by bi allowing making. Um, very large retractable skylights so that run on the grid so that this space climatically becomes something which is connected to the sky very directly. And then sort of moving out from that space really into the void space that you come up the escalators and seeing the market really. This is a view on that escalator looking back. It was important that we use the same material that was happening inside in this void space so that that perception read through when you were passing through here. You were really seeing the fabric of the building. It wasn't a special condition made for you. And then the porosity of the building, really it's not a glass building, it's actually a solid building with voids. And the way it makes relational kind of vignettes to its context, whether ugly or good, which I'm really not interested in, but just the idea of framing context and making a kind of connection through the user to context. Um, these these bands are set up. They're hardwired. So uh, next year, this this the hospital has donated a video wall to project um, health and library issues and sort of adult education issues from this. And these are hardwired for LED, which the council will put in when they fund for. So they just these bands set up hardwired to kind of deal with information um, to make the building more sort of. And sort of to also communicate for the building to also communicate, and that's it. Just when it finished, um, two projects to go. So I hope you're not too tired. <laughs> um, this is moving to Europe, um, and this is the first project we finished in Europe, which is um, a, a competition that we got in uh, Oslo in Norway, and it's a commission to build. Um, a center for the Nobel, P Nobel Peace Prize. Um, the funny thing about this project was that, um, it, for me, it's again another topology, a very interesting topology of the 21st century, I think, in the sense that it's about um, an institution that's about data. It's an institution that doesn't have any objects. It doesn't collect any objects. It collects tons of data. And the notion of making a building is probably ridiculous in a way um, because there is nothing to see, but what they have are thousands. It's interesting that they need for a place to see things is implicit in the public's understanding of how you kind of negotiate these things. So people would turn up at the Nobel <laughs> Center always trying to find something, and it'd be just an office with a medal in the reception, and that's it. So you'd have coach loads of people arriving daily for years <laughs> to see a sort of replica medal. <laughs> and so <laughs> the, the city donated this building as a way of... Uh, sort of trying to negotiate this problem that they had because 
the science prize has a has a has a center because obviously the sciences have wonderful little toys and artifacts that are deposited as sort of a certain detritus from the kind of project of science. You know, you can you can make fantastic artifacts out of it. But the peace prize is is news clippings, radio clippings, TV pieces, pictures, um, if that, and the pictures really aren't collected. So. Um, I don't know if this, it, the, the building that we were donated, this is on the Vespan. I don't know if anybody knows Oslo. Oslo is an incredibly interesting port city, which is still a port. And it's on the fjord. So you have this incredible warm currents coming in. Um, uh, the building is, this is a shot from the building looking out, the castles. It's an incredibly beautiful uh, part of Norway. And this is sort of looking back. And this is the building we're given. It's an extremely ugly building. Um, but it has incredible sentimental power for the community. Um, it's the only building that wasn't leveled by the Luftwaffe um, in this area. As you can see, the whole thing's been rebuilt. And so there's a kind of memory. It was a train station. This is the grids going out to the mountains. And this is where a lot of people took um, journeys, you know, escaped from the city when the bombing was happening in the war. So the building has this quite weird status of being completely listed in a way that's quite... Um, quite obnoxious in terms of its parameters because it's about a kind of emotional sentimentality. So the negotiation with, with any of the conservation bodies is strictly emotional. <laughs> it's, it's about somehow the perceived sense of what you might be doing. Um, so this was quite traumatic to begin with. We, of course, in winning this said, oh, you should take this down. This is a little bit crazy. Um, and, uh <laughs> and they said, yep, why don't you present it to the <laughs> committee? <laughs> and uh, that was... That's when we found out about the Norway uh, conservation body. <laughs> so it was a battle all the way. Um, but in the end, I think both sides were, all, were both very happy. <laughs> I took a second strategy, which is say, fine, um, the building is what it is. We have to keep even the color. So we spent a ton of money restoring it and putting it back to exactly this. There was no, there are a few fragments left in the building. Let me go back. A few fragments left in the building. <laughs> It's a few fragments left in the building, um, which I said we would revere and and frame. And the strategy was to t to reduce this back to the notion of a village, but not in any comical way. It's a very serious idea to actually kind of take the notion of a village in its most, most elemental as a kind of typological uh, sort of butterfly, as it were, to test notions of singular systems, which would then negotiate each other without threshold. So you would have singular units, which just as an agglomeration makes a sequence of space, which can emotionally or emotively kind of enact or stimulate certain things, certain interactions simply between other people and yourself or between data and yourself. So it's to really transform the notion of data into an experience. Um, this thing doesn't want to move on. <laughs> okay. That's going to go three times there. I knew it. Okay. Um, anyway, I think it's just going to go back in a second. <laughs> so the, this is the building. Oh, I thought so. Okay. Um, <laughs> it becomes basically a way of making a series of volumes, the first one being, because we're not allowed to put a sign on the building, we could write on the building, but I didn't want to just do that. The sign I wanted to transform into a kind of an experience, a threshold, which would kind of a, a sort of announce the change that was occurring um, to the building without necessarily writing it. So that the notion of a graphic space, the notion of a space of media, just of media, would be immediately canceled straight away from the first perception of the building to one of a kind of spatial experience, one that it required a negotiation by the, the user, the public. So the object, the thing that's placed in front of the building is the invitation to kind of switch off your kind of desire to look for signs, but to kind of engage with the kind of a sort of sort of opening of the building out to its kind of context. So you have a structure which is built out here, which sort of is basically a map of the world turned from a panoptic position of looking at it as globes to a spatial experience. It's a hoop that you pass through and the map is surrounding you. 
and it sort of articulates light, to an object which is a soundscape, which is in the middle, which is a kind of very quite aggressive moment after this sort of very sweet sort of arrival into the foyer. And then the first thing you're sort of kind of confronted is, is a red room, this, this idea of a blood room. And the reason for this is to make really this notion of under, trying to kind of articulate and understand peace really requires a high degree of uh, understanding about conflict. And that's actually the heart of the Nobel system. It's really about the way in which they kind of analyze the kind of way in which conflict resolution occurs or conflict is kind of manifested and then dissected or kind of brought down. And in a way, I wanted to simplistically kind of just, you know, alert that as a kind of spatial experience, not as a kind of, you know, uh, so that actually the moment that you sort of start to kind of engage with this place, you're sort of disturbed by why this color is here. And then hopefully I think you discover it. If you don't, it doesn't matter, I guess. But <coughs> so in a way, that's the first structure which invites you. That's the second one, which is this resin construction, which is an acoustic structure, which basically, this is, if this is the landmass of the world, this is an acoustic map of the world with all the cities and the languages of the cities being recorded every week and being played through this, this tape. It's like a sort of tape giant CD or giant radio. And then you have the entry space here. You come into a giant exhibition space, which is a cleared out, had a hangar at the back, and a, a chamber for the Nobel Medal. You go up, um, there's a cafe on this side, which is the end of the sequence, um, to an informal exhibition space, a media room, then the heart of the whole project, which is this, what I'm calling a Nobel field, a digital garden, for the laureates, the 101 laureates that are there, education spaces and then down. And I set up this choreography, you know, this was totally, and this is, I guess, why I won it, because basically it became a, it became a journey to the center and this garden to then look back at this and to look back at the city. Um, and this is, I guess, let's just go through it. This is the portal. And the portal moves. It goes to other events that the Nobel does and comes back. This is the city center. This is the, where the Nobel Prize is actually given every year. It's an aluminum structure, aluminum cladding, raw, sandblasted aluminum. It's the resin structure with the uh, acoustic portals, which are basically um, working with an amazing guy in, at MIT, um, David Small, developed the technology to basically um, hardwire this so that it would, um, each portal would be, when you got to it, audible, you'd get a different language in each portal from the floor right down to, you know, right to the ceiling. And it's, a, it's amazing for children. It's not really for adults, it's for children. So when you have a school group turning up, it's quite incredible. They're flooded and they're all lying all over it. And, and that's the idea. It's immediately to understand the global diversity, not to understand, but to move away from the specificity of your own place. And then this is the entrance room where you buy your tickets. And from that, directly from this conflict space into the gold space. And th this is a brass chamber, a sort of hallucinatory tube, <coughs> which basically reflects all around. It's polished, kept polished. Um, it's kind of something I really insisted on, and the client, I'm so glad, has, has in the end really agreed to do it. So that it's basically a kind of hallucinatory space where you're always perceiving the laureate of that year being played continuously and being reflected in yourself in this sort of kaleidoscopic space and then in this space is a medal in a way then this is just a sh I think this exhibition space is just an exhibition space we cleared it and put like a grid up in there these are the fragments that we had to keep which are not even original but <laughs> there are the, all these moments <laughs> through the building where you get these peculiar junctions this is the informal space which is a sort of Norwegian larch rough larch and the idea is it's not a white cube space it's a kind of informal exhibition space with the media satellite room. This is a satellite link room, um, which allows people to link up with a school in Palestine or, or in South Africa and do live link projects. So just then you get into the heart of the space, which is the Laurent room, where you basically get this pavilion, which is a, uh, a sort of blue horizon pavilion with these hun um, hundred stalks. And each one of these uh, stalks uh, has um, a sort of digital image of the laureate. And as you approached it, we developed a sensor interaction, uh, sensor sort of activated system so that as you approach it, um, 
the screen refreshes, comes alive, and starts scrolling information to you. So it's a very passive non, you know, you're not touching it. It's not technology about interacting and keyboards. It's about a kind of interact, it's using sonar technology to allow you to passively browse, almost as though you were in a garden, sort of, sort of seeing different flowers, as it were, uh, to then, you know, sort of interact with the information. So the longer you stay, the, long, the more information it gives you. If you stay for a short time, it moves back. So you go forward, it scrolls through the basic data, the basic summaries, and then it goes on. And this whole space is kind of acoustically linked to a soundtrack um, which allows a kind of, it switches off the sort of decibel reverberation which occur from, from people, um, and it sort of is basically linked to the sonar, so it becomes more melodic when there are more people in there, and it becomes more pulsing when people are not. And it sounds quite kitsch, but actually when you're there, it's really quite a sensory thing, and people spend hours in here. And then the, fi the field, the room is, there are no lights, and it's just kind of lit with this simple LED stalks. Then you finish and you come down to um, the cafe space. And the cafe space is the last matrix. This is a drawing that my uh, friend Chris Afili did for me. Uh, I brought Chris into the project where he developed a reaction to my canopy, which was to make a matrix, a map of the world as interconnected systems. So this is it's basically the entire room is a series of nodes of cities of the world turned into five green shades, which counter my red, as he said. And then the fragments that, are that we needed to keep, we just left. And where we had columns, we just mirrored them. <laughs> so there's a kind of <laughs> sort of totally. <laughs> so we were allowed to use paint, so that was fine. So they got paint. And this is hopefully at the end. This, it stays. Uh, it's, people use it. It's amazing. It's not really en route, but people use it as a kind of experience in the morning and in the evening. It's, it was very beautiful to see this. There was a kind of a lot, it was very interesting, a lot of the authorities were extremely worried about vandalism. The public, we put this out to a public consultation and public loved it and it went up and actually it's amazing the affection that people have towards objects that invite them to kind of do more than just be kind of risk management sort of public realm environments. It was a very big lesson. And then the last project, so probably exhausted, is um, probably the most uh, temporary, which um, in a strange way is now looking like it might become permanent, <laughs> which is <laughs> a joke, <laughs> really, which is a, a project we were commissioned to do for the TB, uh, TBA21 uh, Foundation, which is a very interesting foundation in Vienna, <coughs> run by uh, uh, an amazing woman called Francesca von Habsburg. And um, she c collects art that's not collectible, art that she feels is not about the market system. She deliberately is interested in this kind of art that is difficult to quantify within the market so that she can hopefully somehow, you know, either she's a really clever businesswoman or she really is so passionate. She comes from three generations of art collecting, so I think she's passionate. <laughs> um, to really kind of turn this notion of this new art, which um, releases the um, artist hopefully from a kind of need to kind of put these objects within white cubes to a situation where the artwork you know, ha sort of forms a heteronomy, a sort of a kind of blurring of art and life sort of thing, um, where you make these constructions which are about experiencing the artwork specifically for itself. So it's this notion of, it's a sort of almost a decadent notion of making a public building which is an artwork as an experience for the 21st century. So she has this incredible collection and the Biennale asked her to to show this work. This work um, that she wanted to have in this building that she commissioned us to do was Olaf Eliasson's work called The Black Horizon. Black Horizon is, I don't know if you know it, is a light tape. Olaf has developed this, well, it's a sort of air military technology. It's a sort of Air Force technology, which really basically is light reading uh, machines which can record light, the, the full spectrum of light of 14 hours. He basically came to Laguna, recorded 14 hours worth of light, compressed it into a 14 minute tape and then worked with Zuntable to develop a uh, bulb sequence and a kind of program which would simulate that sequence at high speed. So it's almost like playing, the, playing daylight fast. So this is in uh, um, Sant Lazaro. Sant Lazaro is a very interesting island on the way to the Lido from the Giardini, if you're going across, if you know Venice. Um, and it's uh, the Armenian monastery. And it's a very interesting monastery which um, the monks make rose jam. <laughs> That's their thing. Um, <laughs> it's quite beautiful. <laughs> when they like you, you get a bottle. <laughs> I'm still trying to get through mine. 
It's been a while. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> it's a quiet taste. Um, and uh, the pavilion is, was meant to be just a construction for the Biennale, and it's still up there now because it has had so much interest. And as I said, it, it looks like it might, it might stay. Well, it's, there's a negotiation now to talk about it staying permanently as a building. It's a public building in the sense that it's never closed. It's a 24-hour portal. It's just a structure that's there, and if you can get to it, you can see it. Um, for me, in summarizing the entire uh, sequence of the project, it became very interesting to me. I use these objects sometimes as, they're like butterflies for me. They're my little focusing devices for understanding my own kind of clarity. And in a way, what Olafar was really about making a horizon, a horizon is a circle in terms of perception. Um, I was trying to make a box, just that. And we had to make an enclosure, which is between inside and outside, and that's that. And in a way, this thing was a really powerful sort of reference for me to keep it elemental and to keep it absolutely clear. And so it became about making a very simple volume, which is a box within a box again, which basically was about, you know, and the problem, as you can imagine, is a horizon also was set at eye level, 1.6 meters. So you couldn't install it in any museum because you'd always have a broken horizon because every doorway would do it. So in a way, this work had to be made, had to be kind of, had to have its own construction. So we developed a ramping system which allowed you to come in and under it so that you would always get a continuous horizon around you. So the building is about this sort of in-between zone here, which you come through, walk up, this first ramp. The, f the container of art is here, which is this half meter thick box with this sort of lighting system and the computers in here. Second ramp brings you in and ducks you underneath so that you rise up into the horizon. And then you experience the horizon line, which is three millimeters of light at 5,000 lux, um, which is daylight. And you can imagine this is only like 250 here. So it's this piercing light and what it does is deliberately causes after retinal afterburn on your eye, so you expand it. And that's part of the experience of the work. <laughs> <laughs> Olaf was really proud of that bit, so I always say that for him. <laughs> <It's> afterburn. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, I kind of indirectly wanted to interact with that work, because the, basically the form, what I did is to set up the pavilion so that it hits one o'clock here, and sunset is literally through it. So you get this notion of a kind of, it's a filmic scenario really, where you have a highly abstracted idea of light here, light as we understand it with our eyes, and an architectural light. And in a way, hopefully that prepares you for this. And then the materiality is absolutely, completely reduced and elemental and banal as much as possible. So you have basically this buffer. Um, from the water, then on the land, black corrugated bitumous paper, which interacts with this. The entry. It's the relationship to the Laguna. This room is used for receptions, parties, etc., or just people just sitting here looking back. The ramp. So this section coming underneath here. So this is rising up underneath. And then sort of being in that space, and, and the 14 minutes goes obviously from the uh, blues and purples of the morning to the reds and yellows of the evening. And it's quite, it takes you probably two goes to realize what you've just kind of seen. But it's, it's quite eerie seeing a day being played in 14 minutes. And the light that you're seeing, I mean, you don't see any of this. This is us putting large flashes in here, of course, to try and make you see it. But you literally are in a black space with a light line, which disembodies you, but also makes you very sort of aware of your body in a very direct way. Then that channel back out after the experience, the light of the Laguna, again, moderated hopefully before you then take the light back out. and the building. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening.
questions? Yeah, yeah, sure. See if this is on. Maybe just while, while um, is this one on, Joyita? Just to, maybe just a first question to open it up for as people get settled for this. But mm -hmm. say, uh, say something maybe about um, the process you go through with testing, assessing, calibrating the kind of material decisions. I know it's going to be a sort of obvious first question for you, but I think there, I, I'm curious, you know, you know, one range of questions would have to do when and how do you do that kind of thing? Yeah. I mean, and how much is it prefigured before getting to, say, the site or the, th the projects go on board and are under construction? And maybe the other way to go with that question would be to say something about lessons that might have come out, for example, through the kinds of clients you worked with that explore <coughs> materials, material and surface effects also within their own work yeah. as artists. And are there techniques that you've developed to, to do this, or is it something you make up on the fly as you go with the <laughs> projects? It's, 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 it's a bit, it's between the two. Hmm. It's between the two. I mean, the notion of the surface for me, I guess really started with certain conversations with certain artists that I was kind of, and this notion that somehow the, the surface plane of, of anything constituted an opportunity to make a kind of, to, uh, to start negotiating a kind of spatial condition, a perceived spatial condition. And in the work of certain artists, Chris, blah, 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 et cetera, this was very apparent, how you sort of work with the notion of surface and how you kind of dis dematerialize surface. I obviously, I'm not, a, I'm not an artist making marks. I wasn't interested in that. But what I was very interested in these kind of sort of conversations with um, sort of artists that I knew was that actually through a kind of an architecture which deliberately sought to engage with a kind of material that would lock into some kind of relationship with site or some kind of relationship with program or some kind of relationship to the kind of idea of the thing, one could start to make relational kind of um, um, systems which would somehow start to trigger emotive subconscious kind of relationships. Mm. And so for me, the, the system, the rationale is not, di it's not didactic, it's not about there's a kind of technique. It's more about what does the site produce, what does the program produce, what does the biography produce? Mm. And then how is that somehow tra translated into a palette which can then be kind of you know, curated mm. to bring about an abstracted perception of what those three things were. So it's really kind of, it's assemblage in a way, a kind of reactive assemblage. I mean, as you've been doing it, I'm, I'm curious how much of it is, for example, as you sort out the, the sequence of spaces and the program is, is mm -hmm. sorted in the site, it, are the decisions about surfaces delayed until further testing? Or are they also introduced early on and affect then organizational principles for the, you know, the development of the site and the program and that kind of thing? I, I always try to be linear, but it oh. never works. <laughs> It never works. I try to somehow, I try to somehow um, set up some kind of rationale to try and go through it. But it, it sometimes works the other way. I, sometimes there's a very strong affinity to a certain material, which starts to drive backwards towards the form. Yeah. Um, it doesn't work by. I don't work by making sort of massing models to, dis to discover a form and then think about materials. Sometimes it's it can start with the material and what the possibilities of the material are which then, you know, I switch my own sort of urge to make form to in order to discover the potential within a lot of parameters that are set up. And I like that way of working because in a way, it sets up a kind of m m a sort of guilt-free design, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's sort of, I don't like that sort of slightly, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can we open up with questions in the audience? Hey. <laughs> um, I'm just I'll, I'm curious about uh, your description of the issues to do with the corner site in your in the Denver project, because I mean the whole thing about the American streets where you've got fairly regular grids, uh, grids mm. creates a very powerful issue to do with corners yep. and how you deal with the building in light of how the the, the issues of the, the powerfulness of the corner. Mm. Could you expand a little bit more on that? Yeah, sorry, I, I am, for me, the corner becomes the sort of, in the absence of, you know, New York is the model you know, sort of having a kind of incredible park, et cetera, where you have these grids which are relentless, the corner becomes the most generous part of the urban situation, <laughs> and in a way becomes a kind of hangout situation, um, 
clustering situation. So what the project tries to do is to kind of, in a way, I put a roof over that condition. If, the f if there's a flow plane and a wall plane made by architecture, I just wanted to make a roof in order to kind of somehow configure it as a space, a sort of a conscious space, not a subconscious, not a space that just happens to be a leftover. So that the form, for me, is distorted relationally to make that. And that's kind of what I'm interested in. I'm interested in the way in which you make form by interacting with some kind of social praxis. You know, you're kind of trying to kind of feed into or letting that social sort of analysis, whatever it is that you choose to make it, impacts on the way in which the form then kind of develops and nothing more. And then it can be heightened or tuned or made to perform much more aggressively once you've identified it. But that becomes a way, that's what I'm... And so sometimes it can become very similar and nuanced and very soft. The forms throughout can become quite soft. But if, if the condition is more perplexing, it can then start to become much more sort of phonetically responsive. <laughs> a term um, archaeological lamination <laughs> and I just wondered <laughs> what you meant by that. Um, what I mean is that um, <laughs> this sort of uh, the Lansbury estate it, it romantically for me it, I just sort of see as a kind of ruin <laughs> sort of fantastic architectural you know failed project so it's a kind of piece of so it was like uncovering <laughs> this failed project and laminating it with something new in order to activate it. Yeah. Sorry, I have a tendency to have these jingoistic words. <laughs> was the um, Leeds rating and the Museum of Contemporary Art in Denver, was that a result of, was that intentional or was it the other way around? As in sorry, like sorry, so was what? The Leeds uh, rating? No, 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 that was, um, all the buildings try to perform I'm interested in a kind of performative enclosure, which is in a, a sort of, I hate this environmentalist bullshit, but I, I, you know, it's like this idea that somehow that there's a kind of performative quality to the enclosure beyond its, its you know, it is actually um, doing something beyond just being an image. It is a kind of performing por porous system and porous in the sense of kind of, you know, negotiating environment and also negotiating people is very important to me. It's a way of having some kind of objectivity to it. <laughs> um, going back to the notion of scale, which you mentioned in the beginning, and thinking of your presentation, the way you structure it, how you started with the uh, residential kind of small scale and then you went, went bigger, bigger, and then you came again back in the end small. And thinking of some of your work, which is, I mean, some of your earlier work, like Electro House, and also comparing it to the Idea Store, which is just like around the corner from it. Yeah. And it seems for me that there is like, when it is small, it's extremely sharp and it's extremely powerful. And when it goes big, it becomes quite average to be direct. Yeah. And quite like really <laughs> kind of, I mean, yeah, yeah. disappointing disappointingly looking. It's like, I mean, is there a problem? <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, is there a problem of scale? Or, I mean, I, I, I don't know what, but... Would you, like what, what, do you mean the pornography of the architecture gets less for you or something? No, it's <laughs> not pornography, no. What do you mean? It's what, 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 is, what, what do you mean by, what is, the, what is the judgment that you're making? No, because when it's small and you become quite precise the way you describe it and kind of the details and like, you're talking about things as, I have it down somewhere. Uh, Perception system within construction. But do, don't you see that you don't see, because the, the, I, could, I could talk about one building for an hour. No, no, no yeah, I'm so, sure. So I'm I could sure. do that for you, but the idea is to try and go I, through. I'm sure, but in the end, the building is about experience. It's about like when you see it, how does it affect it, how so you you, you it. don't you don't like the big buildings? No, I kind of, I don't <laughs> <support> them. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I don't like, no, I, just to make it clear, I don't like the big buildings that, y that your office produces. What do you mean? <laughs> the effect, the the effect it, I don't like. Yeah, that's what I said. Extremely sharp when it's small, and then when it goes big, it's rather disappointing. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. 
want to assess it in terms of size or <laughs> any, any questions on this side? Yeah. Maybe could, we, could you pass this back to sorry we just have to use the microphone so everybody can hear it. Mm -hmm. walk that back to <laughs> Hi there. I was wondering yeah. about your decision to have your scale models and your work in the Whitechapel Gallery which I normally associate with well not with architecture. Sorry say that again. <coughs> Sorry. Your exhibition at the Whitechapel. Yeah. Um, I associate the Whitechapel with art. Yeah. And there's your work. Yeah. And I'm wondering what it's doing there. What is it doing there? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Jesus. I'm having a day. <laughs> I don't know. I'll ask the curator. <laughs> they, they occasionally have architecture shows there. Well, I did ask him, actually. Um, <laughs> about that because um, he, he came to to um, talk to us. Who's this? Um, this? This is at Goldsmiths. Who, who came to talk to you? Um, your curator, whose name I've forgotten. Um, Andreas. I think <laughs> Andreas, yeah. That must be him. And I asked him some difficult questions about <coughs> what he was trying to do, whether or not you were the draw to get people into the white chapel <laughs> who otherwise wouldn't bother. Right. Um, and I don't know if he'll think I'm speaking out of turn if he ever hears this. There was this sense of the relationship between the architecture upstairs and Hugo's exhibition Rudonna's. downstairs, yeah. which was fair enough. But we go there and we see um, models and we see your process. We also saw the... Um, the video installation. And while I agree that, you know, perhaps at time architecture is there, I wondered if you were trying to make a different type of statement about your work, not as being art, but close to, and that's why it's there. I mean, I, I, am, I am very interested in this notion of um, absolutely welding art and life, this modernist idea, this sort of... So I am very interested that the notion of architecture is, is coming from art and welded with society. So, yes, the statement is, you know, for me it was f extremely exciting that actually my first show is at the Whitechapel because it actually implicitly underscores the thinking that I have. So, um, you know, it's the way I made the show was directly to try and make both connections to s certain little ideas about art, but also really about a, a kind of social anthropology, a kind of, and then a kind of model sort of ontology, really, landscape, city, um, sort of. So, yeah, I mean, definitely. For me, I'm interested in, the Whitechapel was extremely interesting. I wouldn't, you know, for me it was, it was better to be at the Whitechapel than at any architectural institution. I was, I'm not interested in architectural institutions too much, <laughs> <laughs> except for this one. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have time for one more? Anyone else with a question? Uh, then I think we'll stop there. David, thank okay. you very much for coming back. <laughs> <laughs>